Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Uh, I want to thank everybody um, for coming this evening. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Laurie Haycock Makala. <laughs> Uh, as many of you know, uh, Lori, along with her late husband, P. Scott Makala, uh, were designers in residence and co-chairs of the 2D department here at Cranbrook um, from 1996 uh, through the year 2000. Uh, Lori and Scott were my direct uh, predecessors, and more significantly, um, they were chosen uh, to lead the department immediately uh, after the departure of uh, Catherine and Michael McCoy. Uh, the significance of this um, simply cannot be overstated. For a 25-year period, uh, the design department under the, the McCoys, um, under the direction of uh, Kathy and, uh, and Mike McCoy, contributed significantly to the history of American design. Uh, the appointment of Lori and her husband, uh, Scott, was carefully researched and executed, uh, and it was a, it was a brilliant decision. <laughs> The Makalas, uh, as a couple, truly represented the dream uh, of Cranbrook fulfilled. In Scott, you find a rebellious and raw energy, uh, an iconoclast of the highest order. Uh, you find the power of the id, a pure soul, uh, and a testament to, to, uh, to intuition. While in Lori, uh, you find aesthetic sophistication, uh, intellect, and a rare emotional sensitivity. Uh, in this one couple, um, we, we really do have the Cranbrook dream fulfilled. Uh, in them together, we see all of the characteristics uh, that came to define Cranbrook as an institution of design. The Sicilian Mafia, uh, with its code of conduct, familial structure, emphasis on secrecy, initiation rituals, and global network, uh, is also known by the Italian expression La Casa Nostra. Uh, this is directly translated to this thing of ours or our thing. And I really can think of no better expression that captures uh, Cranbrook than this. Uh, I'm often struck by how profoundly difficult it is to communicate to outsiders the depth uh, of the experience that takes place in this strange community. It's truly La Casa Nostra. Um, institutions have a character and while the genius of uh, George Booth and Eliel Saarinen um, is clearly on display in the uh, stunning architecture of Cranbrook, institutions are built and defined by, uh, by its people. Uh, Lori and her late husband, Scott, have played an extremely significant role in the construction uh, of the identity of Cranbrook. Uh, the family relationships that they built have deep roots in our community. Lori uh, was a critical link in a chain uh, she personally mentored many very influential designers uh, as a small testament, a very small testament to Lori's ability to move the soul. Uh, we're joined this evening by a number of very important uh, designers who studied directly under Scott and Lori and who have traveled from as far away as San Francisco and the Netherlands to be with us this, uh, here this evening. I may be missing a few, and if I do, uh, there is no disrespect meant by, that, by this. But I would like to acknowledge Mike Essel, uh, Brett McFadden, Costas Stratagos, uh, Warren Corbett, Ryan Pescatori Frisk, and Catalina Van Middelkoop, among others, who um, have taken time out of their schedule uh, to spend time with us uh, this evening. Um, it's clear to me that Lori achieved the highest calling of the educator. Uh, she is a continuing catalyst of positivity in the lives of those who are for. Who are fortunate to know her. 
I'm, I'm personally inspired by her and have uh, worked uh, diligently for the past 11 years to live up to her rich legacy as, as designer in residence and to continue her good work. Uh, Lori, uh, Carmela, and Nick, I would like to uh, personally welcome you home. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> Let's get organized here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Elliot, and thank you, everyone, for welcoming me and my children home. <laughs> I am grateful in so many ways to be standing here tonight with family and friends and alumni and current students. Last year, Eric Brandt at MCAD invited me to give a talk at their school in Minneapolis about whatever I wanted. I told him I wanted to talk about my late husband and partner, Scott Makala, an alumni of both MCAD and Cranbrook. And I've discovered over the last year that I'm not the only one who misses Scott. <laughs> My son told me to just power through it, Mom, just power through it. <laughs> so welcome to Dead History, an era, a typeface, and a love story. Now, that's the last time I'm going to fiddle with keynote and all of its blurs and twirls, OK? Um, but um, I didn't plan on doing this, but we're having a little bit of a technical thing. This is the color. <laughs> <laughs> it's really red, and it's red throughout. And you'll, um, you'll now it's pink tonight, so <laughs> enjoy. And I feel like I am home. This is Cranbrook. <laughs> So tonight is for Scott and my children, Carmela and Nikolai, who were just getting started in 1999. They were my creative and technical support for this presentation and are with me here tonight. And without a doubt, they are the future. Wake up, wake up, open your eyes. You're completely wide awake and full of new energy. When the respected designer, Tibor Coleman, died of cancer a few years before Scott, a few, I'm sorry, a few days before Scott, I was moved by the New York Times piece written by his creative partner and wife, not about his work, but about how the family spent the last days as he lay dying in the Caribbean. A few years later, Joan Didion wrote about the loss of her husband and partner in the year of living, uh, the year of magical thinking. Telling stories is therapeutic, especially when it comes to grief. I have not moved on, but I've moved into my widowhood. And that's why, 14 years after Scott's death, I'm standing here with the urge to tell you this love story, <laughs> complete with the bass and drum backbeat. Now you know it's not supposed to be pink because you know that that's always red. <laughs> okay, with that, a few years, I mean, let's see, Scott was born about a year after this t uh, Life magazine photo of John Glenn. Scott was into heroes, and they did not get better than the first astronaut during the Kennedy era. For a kid from the Midwest, as far as Scott was concerned, space was the future. 
and being an astronaut was a great job opportunity. Unfortunately, Scott had poor eyesight, so a trip to the moon wasn't going to happen. A bit of a lisp, not very tall, and with what would now be diagnosed as off-the-charts ADHD, he looked for alternative solutions, but his high school advisor told him to play football and try vocational school. Things could not have been too bad for him because he had a loving, deeply religious family and because he married the prettiest girl in high school, not me, <coughs> saying later that he didn't know any other way to get properly laid. So, <coughs> so we picked Put, took up with a heavy metal Pentecostal band and later a secular art school. MCAD let him in. The best way to describe Scott's years, early years, is through his own music, which you will hear throughout tonight's presentation, except, of course, that Prince song. and jobs came and went, but MCAD served him well. He loved the professors, the art school life, and made lifelong friends. In his last year at MCAD, he met April Griman, who gave him this advice. One, move to LA. If New York is corporate, LA is Blade Runner. Anything is possible. Two, as the schools were at that time still doing cut and paste uh, and outfitted with maybe a couple of PCs, she told him to get a Macintosh, and that would change his life. It was a good idea because Scott could not only not really draw, but he could really hardly write his name. Uh, he had some hand-eye coordination problems, uh, so he went to L.A., he bought a Macintosh, and it did change his life. So, the Olympics were in Los Angeles that year. That's April Griman's poster, which meant lots of work for everyone and made everything literally saturated in color and form. Design mattered in Los Angeles in 1984. But on New Year's Day in 1984, Macintosh announced the first home computer with a Super Bowl commercial called 1984. If you finished high school anywhere in the United States, you read George Orwell's 1984, which talks about Big Brother controlling all information. If you saw the commercial, you wanted a Macintosh. Scott was the first guy on the block to get one. And I'm gonna sh show you that video now. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification computer will introduce Macintosh, and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. There's that bad boy. <laughs> so in 
So I want to talk just for a second about graphic design as a term. Graphic design has always been kind of an iffy title for our discipline. As an undergraduate at Berkeley, it was called visual communications, and somehow graphic designer just meant you weren't really an artist. Graphic design seemed to mean only type and image on a flat surface, preferably with a client. So for designers in the 80s, like Scott, we added terms like new media hybrid or transmedia or pretty much anything but plain old graphic design. As technologies and intentions changed over the last 20 years especially, graphic design has been broadened into terms like design thinking, visual storytelling, digital humanities, and so on. After spending most of my life trying to figure out what it was exactly that we did do, I must say that Scott's work is truly graphic design, and that's enough. Graphic in all ways. Basically, there were two camps. You had the modernists like Vignelli, who felt that design was problem solving, meant to last, and meant to be international in appeal. The postmodernists or deconstructionists like Ed Fella didn't really care much about problem solving. Nothing was forever. And tribes are more interesting than global sameness. So with his old buddy from MCAD, Paul Nickelbein, they started a studio in downtown LA. They showed up at every AIGA meeting in town and somehow got big projects very fast, from restaurants to a Japanese chain store. But even with the Mac, at the time, you still had to use old school tactics to do three-dimensional work. And Scott was, from the very beginning, very interested in chunky three-dimensional uh, type. But it meant using copy camera, photostats, exacto knives, and even clay and wood and whatever it took. Now, <laughs> not to change the subject, but <laughs> Scott was uh, into heroes and anti-heroes. He had a deep sense of history, politics, and religion. He mostly respected people who accomplished a great deal in a very short time. Now, I, you know, he's a guy, so he likes male heroes, but he actually was kind of a feminist. So, there was also another group. <laughs> so we had our Jesus and Mao and Gandhi and, you know, the guys. And he also was interested in women, but it's also with women who accomplished a great deal in a very short time. But the first time I went to his studio, I saw this Malcolm X poster by any means necessary, and I knew this was not your ordinary designer. I was just about to turn 30 when I was included in Sheila de Bretville's 20 Under 30 exhibition in LA about 1985. So ladies, there's nothing is too late. <laughs> I, um, I have also, I had also been, uh, I'd also just had my car jacked near um, my Hollywood apartment, which left me with some sexy scabs and bruises, but no car. So I asked Scott to give me a ride. He was included also, but he was four years younger. I had seen him at a few AIGA events, including April Griman's Jello Mold contest at Otis, and a few other design-related events. But as you know, in Los Angeles, transportation is a kind of an elixir. So this was an opportunity. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> um, but the meeting I remember most was when we were both teaching at Otis. And one day we were standing there while critiquing a student in Sheila's office 
and I remember nothing more or less than the feeling of falling upward. He was literally had a white glow around him, kind of like an energy field. He could have been a UFO for all I know, but the feeling was mutual because he actually began to talk so fast that he stuttered. I knew my life had begun. Griman once described our combination as upper body, meaning me, and lower body, meaning Scott, though this, of course, depended on where you stand. I've always liked that description of our grafted hybrid union. So, you know when you move in with somebody, the first thing you do is you put your books together and your mixed tapes. <laughs> And uh, you can try to figure out which was his and which was mine, but they came together very easily. <laughs> so then we began to teach together, start a studio together. We taught together at Otis. We taught together at Cranbrook. And things began. Otis was a very active place with Sheila in charge, but CalArts was gaining a lot of traction, and the reason why is because there was a group of faculty coming from Cranbrook. Ed Fella, Lorraine Wilde, Jeff Keady, and it was a kind of like um, something was happening and everybody knew it, so we wanted to be there. <coughs> we were really influenced by uh, artists like uh, Kruger and John Baldessari. And I have two slides for Ed Rouchet because we're really liked, we really liked him. <laughs> now when it comes to performance, I think I fantasized that I was sort of the Lori Anderson during her O oh Superman stage. And uh, I think Scott thought of himself as, or some fantasized that he was the Henry Rollins during the Black Flag era. And, uh, and I think sometimes Scott would probably, wouldn't mind being the Laurie Anderson and I certainly wouldn't have mind being the Henry Rollins, so we mixed it up there. But, um, and again, not to change the subject, but you'll see <laughs> how it comes together. So, you know, he was obsessed with the Nazi era, not because of you know, uh, you know, <laughs> but because of Hitler's graphic program. He would say, without that strong graphic program and that performance art, he could not have done what he did. He was seduced by the power of seduction and the possibilities of propaganda. He also liked carnivals <laughs> because along with the many other skills, his many other skills, was an entrepreneurial showmanship on the level of P.T. Barnum, whose greatest show on earth, circus, convinced hordes of people to pay to see freaks. So when P.T. Barnum says things like, the world's largest, grandest, best amusement institution, Barnum and Bailey's greatest show on earth, I mean, years later, the designer uh, Michael Rock wrote, Scott could think of, I, I could think of no other person who could deliver the sentence, we need to maintain secretions and the liquidity of work. Now, he truly had the soft charm of a natural salesman. But his greatest inspiration was his dad. His dad was an inventor who was the most open, non-judgmental man I have ever met. One of Marty's inventions, or we called him Marty the Inventor, Makala. One of Marty's inventions was a martini tester. I am quite sure that this, and not the martini tester, but his father, Marty, was why Scott was able to do what he did. Because his father was full of energy and without judgment. And I think anyone who has been a student of his would say that's what it is, full of energy, no judgment. Well, all that intense energy of Scott's eventually drove me crazy. Uh, my mom told me to take a, make a list of Scott's pros and cons and see the list 
of cons was not very long. It's just that um, living with uh, someone who, as Kathy McCoy once described, as a bull in a china closet, uh, it tired me out. So we broke up. And Marty, who was really into the auto mechanics you know, aftermarket, so Marty and Scott drove home to Minneapolis in a vintage Chevy. And Scott did what single guys do, they go to strip clubs. <laughs> I think you recognize, I tried to find some of his Detroit places. Um, and he threw himself into his work. I thought this was my time to date an older academic who smoked a pipe, and Scott took the opportunity to date a beautiful young MCAT student. Fair enough. Uh, he, uh, you know, and then on a family level, he helped out with his mother, who was dying of Alzheimer's, and I moved in with my mom, who was dying of cancer. At some point, trying to put together, put our relationship back together, we met at a crappy Sunset Hotel, Sunset Boulevard Motel, and, you know, we liked our breakups dramatic and sexy, and so that was the right place. Uh, so we were standing, you know, I was standing in the balcony midday. He took this photograph, one with shirt, one without T-shirt. And later, when we got to Cranbrook, we patched it together, added some text, and called it design. Anyway. Scott was very persistent. Remember, by any means necessary? So he would send me love notes. The best one is still hanging above my bed. The next slide is a work he sent to me. First he drew it out. He had a sign painter paint it and make it, and then sent it to me, along with some music made about our breakup. And I'm going to play that for you now, uh, so... So, someone in the last talk asked me, how did I know that he really meant it to be that way, <laughs> upside down? Well, it's signed at the bottom. It really is meant that way. <laughs> the real moment of coming back together was the day my mother died. Vulnerability is a good thing, because I called Scott, and he got on a plane and showed up at my door that night. With a boyfriend like that, you just make up and you never look back. What I did not see coming was Scott's announcement that he had applied to Cranbrook, and he got in. So I wanted to go too. After all, the new CalArts faculty was all Cranbrook grads, and things were pretty hot there. My Berkeley background and my one year at RISD grad school seemed kind of stale. I had also been teaching for several years and felt that I had nothing new to add. When I told this to Kathy McCoy during my interview, I remember her saying, grad school will help you put money in the bank. Money was her metaphor for ideas, because Cranbrook is not the place you go if your goal is to make a lot of money. Am I right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you first get to Cranbrook in a, in a house full of Cranbrook people, you know what I'm saying. When you first come to Cranbrook, you cannot help but feel you've arrived at the land of Oz. Utopic and gorgeous in every way. There is not a person in the campus who does not feel a magnificent sense of beauty and all possibilities. In a word, life-changing. Kathy Mc and Mike McCoy were getting ready to retire after over 20 years of running the program, graphic design and industrial design, when we arrived. 
Her see here diagram rocked our world. She explained that text or writing are meant to be seen and images are meant to be read. Now this made sense to us. The posters demonstrated what she was talking about and the studio work, like Alan Horry's, was simply gorgeous and seductive and we didn't really care exactly what it meant. We just wanted to be part of it. Kathy and Mike were putting together the Cranbrook Design, the, uh, the new discourse with the work of Cranbrook Design students over the, about 10 years. And Scott worked on this book and we managed to have a few pieces in it. But still, it was hard not to feel like we had arrived when the party was almost over. I made no form, no God within the first month of arriving at Cranbrook, all confused and in doubt. I went from doing highly d detailed books for the Getty and LACMA, but with deconstruction and literary theory and messy typefaces and postmodernism all going on around me, I just wanted to start over. Perfection didn't count anymore. Scott, on the other hand, had no doubt. His first piece, Selector Network, was muscular and direct, a very let's do this thing kind of attitude. He got a hold of a beta version of Photoshop. He started to blur and twirl everything. Kathy had described Scott during these, uh, his Cranbrook grad school years this way, before PsyQuest, Zip, or CD-ROM. He was typically seen dashing down the hall with his hard drive under his arm, connectors cords flying behind him like uh, speed lines. Scott always wanted his computing power bigger and faster. He never could get enough of space, time, and speed. Kathy had him do the new discourse poster, which eventually became cropped into a cover for iMagazine. And you just got to love the swirl. <laughs> now during the boombox days, they were very romantic, but short. Scott took it a step further. He made a boombox by um, collaborating with a furniture design student who wasn't into technology at all. So he said, cool, so you do your wood thing and I'll do my sound thing and we'll jam it together. Now naturally this doesn't work at all, <laughs> but the idea, the idea that we can just kind of uh, patch it together and it was kind of this, you know, just um, whatever is kind of around, we'll just push it together and that's, at the, at the same time, he was making a lot of music, so it, this made sense. Oh, can I just pause for a second? You didn't see that. Um, it was also the heyday of live coverage from CNN. It was during this time, it was during the Gulf War, that people saw war live from their couches for the first time. This blew our minds. It also turned out that the war ended the day our daughter Carmela was born. So during uh, my 32 hours of labor, Scott had CNN going the whole time. So in Cranbrook fashion, he made posters and he made music. The men are praying, facing the west. Oh. Hey.
hear that twice. So by the end of our first year, we had a little Cranbrook wedding, went to the Caribbean for our honeymoon, and came back pregnant, just in time to start our thesis work. <laughs> Everybody does that, right? <laughs> Things get a little blurry here because so much happened at the same time, but I'll give it a try. Scott started to hack away at a new font. It involves sampling, a kind of a mashup strategy of two fonts, Vagbold, it was designed for Volkswagen magazine, uh, Volkswagen magazine, <laughs> Volkswagen car, and Centennial. The font was almost impossible to use for anything other than a, an event or product meant to express the new, although I believe that at some point um, I saw it in a Tampex ad, um, but that was weird. <laughs> Eventually, he made this promo poster for the font with a photograph of his father's hand on his mother's head just after she died. About 10 years later, MoMA puts the font in its permanent collection. Now, during my pregnancy, oh no, I already see. Yeah, yeah in nine, during my pregnancy, Scott worked on the font at school, and at night, at home, he would make his music. So by 1992, Emigre Music released the first Audio Afterbirth CD. But at the time, according to modernists like Vignelli, this was all a pile of shit. <laughs> but Rudy Vanderlands, the founder of Immigre, disagreed. So before graduation, again, thanks to Kathy McCoy, I interviewed as a design director, as the design director at the Walker Art Center with then director Kathy Halbreich. I interviewed in a short dress with uh, plastic grapes pinned to my chest here, eight months pregnant. I was offered the job on the spot. <laughs> so we went to Minneapolis. And I am amazed, that when I arrived I have to, I was amazed that I got that job. <laughs> so every day I went to work to a beautiful modern studio, hired lots of fantastic people while Scott stayed at home and took care of Carmela. I was making books, and that's, the Fluxus book is actually has the Carmela font that it was another font he was working on um, at the same time as Dead History. Bruce Nauman, Hannah Hawk. I mean, I could not have been happier. Scott was at home, but he started working instantly and he started working on the MCAD uh, uh, catalog project. He worked in a tiny basement, uh, he, he worked in a tiny bedroom above, uh, uh, upstairs, heating formula downstairs, and made the most Baroque, layered, visual form I have ever seen. He was so fast that one week, that a week before the week before press time, all the files were lost in a way that it happens. All the files are lost. We, I've been doing it for weeks and weeks, and it's gone. He reconstructed the whole thing in a matter of days. He never complained. I don't think he, he actually enjoyed it. <laughs> the, the thing that I salute most is MCAD's president to have approved such madness. Although I believe enrollment spiked. 
I'm going to just scroll through a couple of these beautiful messes. And you can see the unreadable, baroque state of mind. And it doesn't matter if you like it or not. It's just that the thing is, Scott got it done, approved, and <laughs> what can I say? He put everything in it all at once. Then he and his old pal Paul Nickelbein made a promo video for MCAD. Scott did the sound and type and Paul the, sh the video. Now I'm going to show you just a few clips and just understand this was a long time ago and it's sort of a technology that looks now like, well, so what, not interesting, but it actually was quite a new at the time and you can also, you can see a lot of the work that he did later it's kind of there. It, the beginnings are really in there. Most of the students that I've worked with here are, are very dedicated. You find work which appeals to you, and you, you, you meet the people who make it, and it, it's a community. My art has like drastically changed in one year since I've been here. What's three more years going to do? So <clears throat> Kathy McCoy was on the board of the American Center for Design and suggested having a conference on the emerging field of new media and time-based communication. She asked Scott to design the announcement po poster and promotional material, and together they invented the name Living Surfaces. And that name continues to resonate as a description of new media. Now, I'm going to quote Kathy McCoy here. A good indication of the fault line Scott liked to straddle came from Milton Glaser when Scott exhibited the poster at the AIGA conference later that year. Milton told Scott he found the poster to be the ugliest image he has ever seen. Horrible or beautiful, but never neutral. Undoing nothing, uh, the Mohawk Paper Company asked Scott to design pages for Tucker V. Meister, an industrial designer, writing on doing nothing. As you, the idea is sometimes, designers, it's best to do less than more, leave it alone, then add to it. That was the simple idea. I must thank Tucker, who sent me these pages a few weeks ago, uh, who never complained, that you could never read a word he wrote. I mean, at all. <laughs> so at the Walker, I worked on the last issues of Design Quarterly and we asked Scott to do the cover and write about his digital vision. I believe this was his manifesto. He wrote about and visualized the digital future we are experiencing now. Simultaneous information, all at once computer screen, all, at, all in the computer screen, all at the same time. So when he talks about the facts and the videotapes and the studios, the stores where you rent, it's this idea that this is, this will change, and it has. He would include everything, that's his daughter, his, his father, friends, everybody got in on the act. But he wanted to see everything fluid, sensual, and full of color. Now about the same time, I was working on a new identity for the walker. 
I thought we didn't need a logo, we needed a typeface that could just change like clothes or run through the system like blood. We commissioned Matthew Carter to come up with something. And after a long creative exchange, he sent us what we started calling snap-on serifs. The design staff, especially Matt Eller, experimented with the font and the Walker and the Walker font, like Dead History, eventually ended up in the Museum of Art permanent collection as well. Burn. Scott was beginning to do lectures now on his work, and that this may be one of my favorites. He would set fires in the backyard to photograph, and he would, he kind of, this was sort of before tongue rings came in and then out of fashion again. Um, Scott, <laughs> Scott uh, had a woman get her tongue, you know, ringed, what do you call, po thank you, po ringed, <laughs> so he could do this shot. Oh. While Scott did spend a lot of time with the swirl, twirl, saturating tools, he really was after creating depth of field with typography. So he started creating 3D type and even had metal type created by another Cranbrook student, actual forms. So I'm just gonna quickly show you when you really start to see him trying to heave out those shapes, push them out as much as possible, for different projects, and I'm just gonna comment on the um, new power generation, that's a, uh, the gold nigga, that's not my term, uh, but that's a Prince, when Prince started another band, after, you know, after the new, uh, so he started new power generation, we were Minneapolis people, loved Prince, and uh, so he had the opportunity to do this, and as you, as I've mentioned, Scott kind of has this, uh, this bipolar thing where, it's trashy is great, and then very spiritual. He also had a kind of a boy crush on David Sylvian. So between the boy crush he had on Prince and on David Sylvian, he could go both ways here. Now, at the same time, I was attempting to put together an exhibition called Digital Campfires, where designers could uh, speculate on what a digital reading experience might be. The project never really got off the ground, but the individual projects with people like Lorraine Wilde and uh, Adam, uh, Alan Horry, they were pretty spectacular. But Scott's projects focused on the Bill of Rights, the first two, 10 amendments, and again, wrote music to match. we started, you know, there's more work, like this video for Lotus Notes, and then, I don't really know how this happened, but the hookup was probably with a friend of ours, he was a director, Jeff Plansker, who worked with propaganda films, but suddenly he was working on the most expensive music video of all time. Michael Jackson's Scream, directed by Mark Romanek, well, he even, um, got to see Michael Jackson without his uh, prosthetic nose, and I uh, tried, I was very busy, so I tried not to be jealous, but anyway, the 3D type thing is really starting to pay off.
had mixed feet. I'd like to show you the whole thing, but we've got a lot of video to go through, so um, we'll take choose carefully. So does Minneapolis-based Macalus electro-futuristic futurism embody the end of the 1980s or a new avant-garde? Rather, for me, this work represents the ultimate extension and exhaustion of the little Baroque period of the 1980s. So, yeah, about this time he was getting a lot of positive press <laughs> from design magazines like How, I, Creative Review, and most were very enthusiastic about the new. Others, not so much. Then we were asked to apply to the Cranbrook 2D department as a couple. Again, Kathy was our big supporter, but as a couple. This was beyond our wildest dreams. Neither Scott nor I would have nailed that job by ourselves. So we jammed the baby and the books and the flat files into the car, invited a few folks who were working with us to come along and we returned to Cranbrook. Shut up and I guess we thought we needed to update Kathy's C read diagram, <clears throat> so we made our own. Define your obsession, select your network. Find your materials, reach your audience. Obsession is your ignition, your swag, food, and payload. Now in current vernacular, I might say, rock your obsession, but obsession as swag works too. And we had our mantras. Select your network. The audience is real. And then the showman, remember P.T. Barnum? Took it a step further. I am the pimp. <laughs> Respond to the current condition. In other words, everything that is not about international style, problem solving, or anything like that. The present moment. Students as family. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys are here. <laughs> I mention our students because they're, and their work often because they weren't just students. They were a family. The students were brothers and sisters. And Scott and I played some sort of weird uh, abstract version of a surrogate parent, but not quite. When we weren't in their studio, they were in ours. When we weren't in our studio, we were in theirs. Family and work were entwined to the point where my daughter knew where to find Ryan's giant peanut butter stash and Mike's Mr. T, I'm about to cry, <laughs> Mike's Mr. T collection. It was a very special time. I'm going to just show a couple of pieces from the student work because I'm so happy you guys are here to show the work, show your current work, and to see the students, the current work of the current students. <laughs> uh, but I'm just going to show a few things. Our one of our very first students, Brad Bartlett, uh, we all kind of had this sort of do it all at the same time performance. In fact, this piece by Brad was done in this stage but he dragged all the old chairs up to the stage, designed his font, projected it all. Uh, there was a, maybe a year or so later, Jeff Miller, he was into BMX riding, so he did this piece with his sounds and his fonts and his performance and his writing. And I'm gonna show... Um, <laughs> We're so lucky to have Brett in the audience. Um, now, I'm going to just read to you a description that Brett wrote about this project. 
Um, part of the project's pleasure was its absurdity. It was and remains, I, I was and remain your classic weakling. The performance work, um, let's see, the performance work I mentioned, I, I mentioned paid off like that. Hold, pop. Wait a minute. My power, my pad is, hold on. I'm sorry, Brett, I'll get this going. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, in the most successful piece, it, I read an essay about the, about the deadlift. Well, Mike, his trainer, deadlifted and then dramatically crushed 400 pounds of cinder block. Then I, in turn, deadlifted 160 pounds of Mike. But the project also taught me sincere lessons about how my body mechanics, uh, about body mechanics that I still use today. And as a student, it gave me a history of physical culture to learn about, imagery to use, and aesthetic to build design around. So I show you these pieces too. When we talk about obsession, this is what we're talking about. Locate your obsession and then get to work. So now the studio is in full swing. Students are working with us back and forth. And, but it actually looked more like this, but again, you can't really read it. <laughs> um, and so the work began. The first thing, one of the first things going on, we were working with the director, Jeff Plansker, on a Nike commercial. Scott did the type, it's Jeff's uh, direction. At the same time, we worked um, with a lot of people from the Science Museum, the Cranbrook Science Museum, um, on a um, multi-projected experience called the Connections Theater. I haven't had a chance to see if it's still there, the idea it was a permanent installation. Gerhardt, is it still there? <laughs> Thank <you>. All right. <laughs> um, and I was working on the identity, and Scott and the crew designed this very, uh, it, I, I don't show the video because it's, you have to actually be inside because there's maybe six projectors that are all crossing over with images and sound, so I really, you just have to kind of be there. Um, but then one day, um, Actually, a few months after we arrived as the new designers in residence, I had a brain hemorrhage. The bleed took on a new meaning. That is another story for another time, but I will say that as I lost my ability to use language, numbers, and general logic, and took months to recover, but Scott, our hero, was on the scene <laughs> and he kept me from being afraid. But again, as Cranbrook, like Cranbrook, when faced with real experiences, we made art, design, and music. And I sat down with an old electric piano and wrote this song, and my disability became my grace. And I'm just gonna... Escape of blood from us. There's some I got a bad headache I'm heavy bleeding Brain shut down Leaves me stranded I got laid down flat I'm in recovery So 
So when Scott first used this expression, bleed on all four sides, he may have just meant in printer terms, let the photograph bleed on all sides of the page. It in itself is against the rules at that time. But of course, metaphorically, he meant forget the paper altogether. Just let it bleed. So I'm going to try to just show you a couple of pieces that, you know, you just see this, you just, you just can't get enough of the page, it just wants out. <laughs> so, you know, the Nike ad, we had probably 15 students, everybody in the studio had an ad, we, everybody worked on it, and it was a pretty exciting time. Probably irritating for some students. <laughs> But what he was saying really, what he actually said about that is, I was trying to grab a chunk of experience and have that bleed on all sides. So the work continued, bleeding, blurring, fattening, twirling, swirling. Now, this was one of my favorite pieces, but um, I, you know, I know, it, again, I have to keep saying this, I know it looks kind of, so what now, but um, this was when you could not go outside with your laptop. There w this was totally new. <laughs> the, and so, you know, we borrow, you know, one of our guys are working with us, the skateboard, and I go out there trying to look like I'm 18, and that was, we sat out there going, can you freaking believe it? We're sitting outside with our computer. And um, I learned later that my, t you know, I was kind of like the one who liked to write, write the text or copy or whatever, so the, I thought into it was so cool. Well, the reason why this actually never got approved is because into it is actually a, um, what a program, right? Uh, so it got aced, but, and I, Somebody told me recently that I just said, well, I don't care if it exists, it's that I'm not gonna change it. Now, I don't recall really doing that, but, <laughs> okay, did we get a kill fee for that? Um, so, anyway, we started then, we, were, we made a new batch of work, we made a new, uh, we worked with students and friends to create another CD. This was called Addictions and Meditations, and it was the first music video we made for ourselves. The cool part of this video, um, and again, I know, old news now, but it was that we made the video and embedded it into the CD, and that was very new. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of that uh, video. Not to change the subject, but you know, David Carson, 
Tomato from London. Uh, they were at the top of their game, and uh, it was a feisty, competitive time. So the heat was on for us and for the students. And big, big books by designers about themselves was all the rage. So Lawrence King Press in London invited us to do our own big book with the writer Lewis Blackwell. So in the summer following the hemorrhage, I visited, uh, or actually before I go into this, I just, how this book got called, where is here? I just wanna tell you this little story. In the summer following my hemorrhage, I visited my brother, who's a Zen monk. He was living in Seoul, Korea at the time. And when I was there, I learned something about wordless teaching and the demon demonstrative argument. The Zen master used a technique called the koan to sharpen the mind. He would say, what is this? And the student holding up one finger would say this. With the speed and precision of dueling swords, Okay, pause. The student would answer this. The Zen master would say, and where is here? He asked, looking at the students in the eye, and the student would answer, here. So we decided to call it, where is here? And the idea was that this was about new terrain, where where is here is everywhere. It didn't really matter where you lived what your city, where you were from. We ended up inviting hundreds of artists and photographers and designers from all over the world to submit work. We sat in a studio in London with Lewis, sorting out what we found interesting. And if you thri flip through the book, you will have no idea where you are or who made what. It is in the back of the book that it's all there. The font was created by visiting, by a visiting, we had visiting students from Switzerland, and with a multi-master characters, they called the font Detroit. There's a lot of different things in here, but Detroit is kind of the primary font. And um, I'm gonna show you some pieces from there. Warren Corbett was our student, uh, one of our students at the time. He worked closely on this book with us. And I want to quote him on this, Scott, he would say, Scott's question was always, what will shock people, and then, and how can we get it in the stores in uh, Singapore? So it was this kind of combination of, of energy and work, and we, I'm gonna just show you a few pages. There's a lot of visual material, I'm not showing you here, just a few things, but basically this is, he did a lot of the stuff, we had a lot of other, you see it's just a total, it, it all blurs together. I'm not sure I would do that the same way now. Um, and this is just some of Scott's things, and I can't really explain it other than that he was into all the typical things, you know, sex and death and all that stuff. So um, we were also spending a lot of time in Switzerland, so we, were, we did a whole section with um, our friends there, but still, Every time there was anything that should be able to be distinct and you should be able to know what you're, where you are, Scott would flip it, turn it, spin it around. So the only way you could kind of tell is if you could just sort of feel it, like that kind of feels like Switzerland. Now, uh, Bridget Cabry, Cambry, who was also a student of ours and ended up being uh, working in our studio after graduation. She was working um, on a font called Weird, History, uh, Weird Science, Weird History, that's good too. Um, Weird Science for the Cranbrook Museum uh, catalog by the same name. That became the font for the opening title sequences for the Fight Club directed by David Fincher. Special effects. Digital domain, I somehow I, I'm so trained to make sure everybody's credited. And I'm gonna just show you the full thing here. <laughs>
asking me if I know Tyler Durden. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> now, Scott was obsessed with snowboarding. Let's see. And as a snowboarder, he knew that speed is your friend, meaning just that, that speed will get you down the hill. I also know that Scott was the fastest maker anyone had ever seen. Everybody knew it. So when he made this last reel, he liked the idea that all of the work could be shown in less than two minutes. So here we go. So, I guess the term is shout out to Jim Gladman and Kurt Miller who were working with us in the studio on everything all the time. And at this point, um, we were pitching a project for Rosignol Ski and Snowboard. Um, now, like I said, he was obsessed with snowboarding so that this Doing a Rosignol project, because of what it was, um, and because it was the biggest and best paid project we had ever had. We had just had a second child, Nikolai, and the work was changing. You can see a lightness and simplicity in these couple of sketches that uh, were, you know, we, were his kind of things that got us the job. I'll show you these. Faith in action. And you can see something's emptying out. More white, doesn't need to say as much. Simple. Faith and action. God is close to you. Vertigo is fun. This is a medical gurney for turning a patient totally upside down so that the blood can move to the brain quickly. This will be relevant in just a matter of one week. Life changes in an instant. 
the ordinary instant. I wish on that day we were given enough time to decide if he should ease up on the mountain biking and the snowboarding and the travel schedule, ease up on the wine or try an experimental treatment in Mexico or Switzerland or a hospice or home care or, but it really didn't happen that way. What happened was that um, he had just spent a month in Brazil and a few days in Vermont and Scott arrived home having scored that Rosignol gig. So I assure you, I gave him a glorious welcome home, all wifey and tacky, with a pink mini skirt and white bobby socks. The kids were in bed. So for that, I am at peace. But the rest of the story wasn't quite like that. It was spring, a few weeks before graduation. The day after the, that sexy homecoming, he complained of an ear infection. By the evening, he went with his then eight-year-old daughter to the emergency. He got some antibiotics and came home. By midnight, he was asking me for a blowjob, and I said, go to sleep, sailor. Uh, I'll catch you in the morning. In other words, life as usual. By 3 a.m., he said he couldn't breathe. He said he was afraid that if he fell asleep, he wouldn't wake up. We thought maybe a hot shower would help, but within minutes I realized that he needed an ambulance and not a shower. He died on the way to the hospital and then revived once there without any brain activity. He lay in a coma for two days. I thought about our life, where and how I would take care of him for the rest of our lives without his brain. And then he died. But before he died, they put him on one of those vertical gurneys trying to get some brain to his, or some blood to his brain. And that was it. During those two days, I actually had to tell Rosignol that he was sleeping, afraid that if he came back to life, he would be really mad if I dropped the ball. So the studio. <laughs> the students pulled together and worked every uh, day and night on that project. As Scott lay dying, <laughs> Rosignol flew in, presumably to tell me that the job would be pulled but our team prevailed. They kept the project, the students, the students pulled it off for Scott. And we kept that project for a year. Scott would have liked his port, his I was going to say his portfolio. <laughs> he would have liked his obituary. And then our friend Sven Volken in Berlin invited me to do some pages in his book, Beyond the Borders. And this is what we made. You shocked me. And my daughter's line, God is a fairy tale. ever onward under other skies. We, Scott had been working on an exhibition for months that was planned to open in uh, Oslo in the fall. 
But after Scott died, I decided to ask all of the students to not meet on their first day at Cranbrook, but meet in Oslo. And they did. And that's the way we moved forward. Ever onward, under other skies, I embrace you with all of my fever, fervor. <laughs> Thank you. Don't worry, I won't hurt you. I only want you to have some fun. <laughs>